let me start by saying how honored, how this a great honor for me to stand on this grand stage at a gathering of global scholars and intellectuals to give this keynote address. For me, a keynote address is not just a lecture. And a keynote address in such a significant gathering, like, like the African Conference, poses a huge challenge for the keynote. It will therefore be my immense pleasure to share with you some of my thoughts on the theme of this conference at the intersection of development, politics, and institutional disarticulation in Africa. I sincerely hope that the insights I have garnered in my confrontation with the public service and governance institution in Nigeria, and most especially in Africa, we sufficiently invigorate our deliberations and discussion at this conference. But permit me to start by paying my debt of gratitude. I'm indeed most grateful and indebted to this African giant intellectual and iconic scholar, Professor Tony Power, for the privilege of this keynote. Very few very few that I have worked with had earned my respect in the measure that Professor Fano Professor did. I do not think I have any new thing to say that most of you do not already know about this mentor, mentors, and academic trailblazer. Professor Fano is everything you know him to be and much more. I'm not sure I understand how he picks those he wants to mentor. But I suspect that Olodumare, which is the god of the Yorubas, has some precious few <coughs> ones by him sprinkled through all humanity with the uh, discernment to mentor. How they are from the Safarola, the middle tense. I shall speak to the test of this keynote in four parts. In the first part, I will explore the strong main strong institution discourse within the agency structure dichotomy, which is extensively explored in social science literature. And I will deploy to interrogate the institutionalization arguments as my conceptual framework. I will ride on the submissions of Mills and Harps in their book titled The Third, Africa's Third Liberation, to critique the Africa rising euphoria. And that will enable me to prospect on what's next for Africa in terms of development possibility. With that, I will restate the reality of African leadership, the reality, that, the, the reality that African leadership must address, drawing inspiration from the Asian Tigers, African closest benchmark. I will then advance three major recommendations at two levels, the level of governance reform and contingent institutional reform imperative. Strong men, strong institution, strong men versus strong institution, institutionalism, and African development. One of the funniest theoretical issues in the social science literature of all times is the relationship between agency and structure especially the urgent need to shape human behavior in society. The challenge is the whole uh, in the old discourse 
is to explain how human beings, with the multitudes of their often contradictory desires, preferences and needs, can act <coughs> in such a way as to ensure social order and hence progress in the society. The agency structure that I could do is further aggravated because most theories structure the difference between the two in terms of binary opposition that structure is systematic and pattern, while agency is contingent and random, that structure is constraint, while agency is freedom, that structure is static, while agency is active, that structure is collective, while agency is individual. In July 2009, while on a state visit to Ghana, Barack Obama waited on the agency structure discourse in a manner that speaks to the trajectory of black cluster governments in the continent. While addressing the Ghanaian parliament, Obama identified four areas that are critical to Africa's future, namely democracy, opportunity, health, and the peaceful resolution of conflict. And you would agree with me that all the four depend on the building of and sustenance of strong institutions. According to Obama, and I'd like to quote him, in the 21st century, capable, reliable, and transparent institutions are the key to success. Strong parliaments and honest police forces, independent judges and journalists, a vibrant private sector and civil society. Those are the things that give life to democracy because that is what matters in people's life, unquote. Obama then concluded with the recommendation, and I quote, Africa does, doesn't need strong men. It needs strong institutions. Though Obama's stringent recommendation is made as a political statement that is meant to challenge Africans to the charge of their own destiny and future the statement has the full weight of the theoretical underpinning of institutionalism behind it. From Aristotle to the theories of new institutionalism, when Obama recommended strong institutions over strong men in the reconfiguration of Africa's governance trajectory and dynamics, he was calling for a critical intervention in Africa's institutional engagement and framework in a manner that will prevent tyrants and despots from hijacking the political institution and structure of government for their own selfish purposes. Like most political statements, the challenge of Obama's statement goes beyond just asking <coughs> Africa to build a strong institution. Let me, let's reflect a little more on the whole leadership challenge in Africa. The leadership challenge Leadership deficit is a global phenomenon which validates Anthony Lee Cocker's seminar question in his 2007 bestseller, Where Have All the Leaders Gone? The thesis underlying this poster is brought home to Africa if we interrogate the more Ibrahim governance index and the difficulty that the Foundation Prize Committee has faced in selecting winners in Africa. This in turn raises the question as to whether the African region was unable to produce a leader that made a difference to his or her environment, with the exception created lately by the award to the immediate past president of Liberia, Ellen Joseph Sheriff Lake. Consequently, why effective response to African challenge in your leadership? We need to conceptualize the meaning of leadership and their qualification given Africa's peculiar circumstances. Indeed, going by the Moe Brian Governance Index and the effort at the construction of indicators or indices against which the performance of African leaders could be periodically measured, it is safe to submit that no matter how great, leadership cannot by itself alone improve economic and social prospects. I might as well restate my earlier question. 
His leadership acting alone up to the challenge of development group governance in Africa. The question as to whether leadership is an independent variable or one that is dependent on critical variables that define the environment and its political culture. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, taking a cue from this trend of analysis, for me, the real theoretical and practical challenge, which I sincerely hope this conference and the distinguished scholars and participants will all unpack and unravel, is that of how to critically handle the supposed dichotomy between strong men and strong institutions. Are we wise to make that distinction? No matter how emotionally strong we feel about African present predicament, a number of questions drop from uh, uh, that question and that requires interrogation of this course. Of course, these are what nature and quality of leadership is transformation given peculiarities across African continent. Looking around Africa, what exemplars, both in past and present, could we could be heard of as role model, perhaps within the framework of African peer review mechanism for African leaders, leaders whose leadership style and legacies could be benchmarked across the continent? To what extent are the development crises in Africa systemic or attributable to leadership deficit? How effective are Western democratic principles and mechanisms as they exist effective in assessing political leadership by rewarding or sanctioning failure in Africa? How complicit is the citizenry in Africa in Africa's crisis of leadership? What structural changes are needed to create political culture that to throw up leaders based on competence and to support such competence with institutional capacity to deliver. Back to the initial theoretical exploration, this question inevitably returns us to the very heart of the agency structure that it discussed and the urgent need for a nuanced understanding of that discourse in a manner that enables us to rethink institutional dynamics in Africa. Anthony Giddens, Structuration Theory, provides a nexus that is more nuanced than the attempt to dichotomize agency and structure. It is this nuanced understanding between agency and structure, individual and society, strong men and strong institutions that Obama missed out in his impassioned political statement. And taking the argument for that, therefore, I'd like to reference Asimoglu and Robinson in their book published in 2013 titled Why Nations Fail. It offers such a tempered understanding of the role of institution and institutionalization process in Africa, taking cognizance of Gideon's structuration theory and its interface, the interface between domination, power, and resources. The argument is simple but fundamental. Prosperity or poverty is the function of what political power is deployed to achieve in institutional terms. In other words, the difference between Europe, North Africa, North America, sorry, and South Saharan Africa lies in institutional resources that the political elites in both continents have decided to invest in. I will resist the temptation here to indulge in the pleasure of arriving as a Google and Robinson delicious arguments in why nation face. Suffice me to say, that the wealth and poverty of nations respond essentially to institutional fundamentals and the decisional quotient which the leadership can deploy to handle the relationship between the economic and political institutions, specifically between the extractive and inclusive institutions. Thus, nations fail simply because they have created negative matrix of extractive economic institutions backed up by extractive political institutions that hint that economic growth. So what's next level to prospect for Africa? Here I will reference Mills and Abs, African Toll Liberation. I will make this point. It becomes very easy to write 
on the institutionalization argument as the basis for a rethink of the whole discourse in the pursuit of what means and means calls African thought liberation. Now, the prospect of means and the prospect of what means and means calls means and has called African thought liberation demands that we interrogate the African rising before it. And then the question, can Africa, African states, if the opportunity recalls, reoccur, convert the incredible GDP-inspired growth, economic momentum of the immediate past years into governance leverages <coughs> to defeat unemployment, poverty, infrastructural deficit, thereby setting up on the path of global competitiveness. Now, a brief critical review. According to statistics, Africa leads the other continent with the highest number of people living in extreme poverty at 383 million, compared to 13 million in North America and 0.7 in Europe. Poverty in Africa is further compounded by a gross infrastructural deficit that has consistently defeated the hope of democratic empowerment in Africa. Green statistics further shows that African infrastructural deficits are approximately $90 billion every year. It requires $90 billion every year invested in the next 10 years for, the, for us to overcome the deficit. This deficit is mostly demonstrated in power and the poor road network. On the one hand, research, especially from the World Bank Group, reveals that, and I quote, the 48 countries of Saharan Africa, with a combined population of 800 million, generate roughly the same amount of power as Spain, with a population of 50, 45 million. On the other hand, and with regards to roads, quote, only one third of Africans living in rural areas are within two kilometers of an all-season road compared to two-thirds of the population in other developing regions. Poverty is the real constraint of our infrastructural disarticulation that ensures that African governments are not able to deliver on policies and programs that can generally empower Africans and make their lives worth living. <coughs> A massive deceleration in investment growth from 8% in 2014 to 0.6 in 2015 translate into a further decline in African economic growth rate and a significant reduction in the quality of life of Africa. Even though this has rebounded to 2.6 in 2017, it has not facilitated the kind of transformation that Africans have been waiting for since independence. And so, we need to present Africa's real encounter narrative. The green statistics constitute the basis of the African really counter narrative that seeks to puncture the euphoria of optimism with a strong dose of development realism. The real issue is how does African rising discourse explain the persistence of high poverty, inequality, under unemployment, my governance, dependence on natural resources and low product economies, low industrial capacity, lack of global competitiveness, and marginalization in the global political economy. Now, how optimistic should we be in living on means and apps uh, 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 thesis that Africa has gone through the first liberation, it has gone through the second liberation, it only needs to organize itself for third liberation. There is an assumption in that that the third liberation is founded on the success of two preceding liberation. This is far from the truth. What a contemporary African historical realities demonstrate is that Africa has still not recovered from colonialism. What constitutes the first liberation and the entrench of autocracy on the continent, which is the second liberation. There are still numerous colonial legacies and a new neo-colonial global hegemonic dynamics that are currently responsible for Africa's post-colonial development wars. Added to this is the siege type syndrome 
that they show, for instance, that the recently deposed Robert Mugabe, who spent 37 years in government, that the equally deposed Yame, Yaya Jame ruled with an iron fist for 23 years. And you, you were in Museveni, we still be ruling in Ghana after 10, 30 years and counting. Joseph Kabila in DRC, Omar Bongo, and now his son in Gabon, or dear, or dear in Cameroon and in Liz Bozo. The influence of global neoliberal hegemony and the autocratic syntactism still remain the limitating influence on the whole consideration of African politics. What is the way for? What's my sense of an imperative for 24? Whether it's in Nigeria, Ethiopia, Burundi, Gambia, or Sudan, the developmental challenge in Africa is simply one of resolving infrastructural gap in order to open the African economic space so that business can compete. Thus, expanding employment and reducing poverty. That would be my summary of the challenge of Going forward, therefore, delivering on the next phase of African liberation, the light of the current reality of the continent requires solution to overcome leadership deficit as instigator for far-reaching institutional rebuilding to crystallize the fusion of the developmental state in Africa. What are the priority challenges? A bit of African reality has seized that make transformational leaders, leadership that rise on the crest of the developmental state so very critical. One, the fact that Africa's population is expected to increase from 800 million as of 2012 to 1.5 billion within a generation. These demographics will obviously put pressure on finite resources and institutional current capacity of fragile African state. By 2025, nearly one quarter of the world's young people below 25 will be from Africa. A trend that will deepen current unemployment and poverty level with a tenant increasing frustration, which will in turn shape politics in the shape of political behavior of an angry people. It is this worrying trend that made Paul Polia in his publication 2006 when he predicts that half of post-colonial states in Africa will slide back into conflict within 10 years of resolution of their conflicts. This sounds logical, as elections look likely to remain routine for many African states, as they are unlikely to be issue-driven, making democratic institutions all the more fragile. That is benchmarking analysis of comparative regions, comparable regions who have transformed their economy, and the Asian Tigers remain our best seminar comparators. How did they leave African regions behind? the economic development rates within a space of three decades. How did they break out of this mode of external dependence to go into manufacturing powerhouses for the world market in automobile, electronic appliances, computer technology, and so on? Answer, the rejected foreign prescribed development models like import substitution and instead pursue a bold, aggressive export-oriented development strategy. They imposed discipline on local consumption. They scaled up investment in education and training, not just to improve educational standards per se, but also with a view to raising per capita productivity of the economy. They invested heavily in research and development. They ensured judicial, man the judicial management of the national resources. Then they re engineered their public sector institutions into world class professional services through undiluted meritocracy and competency-based human resource management. Going forward, I'd like to speak to three recommendations. One, Africa needs a new generation of leaders. A new crop of leaders distinguished by their managerial sophistication and policy intelligence, who could, in spite of the fragile political climate, deepen and consolidate the celebrated positive economic good leverages to ignite deep structural transformation. A new generation of leaders that are cosmopolitan, dechimalized patriots who could inspire by example and create a new influential core beliefs that would drive economic debate to ignite the required transition 
from following the bad policy to locally driven agenda. The new core leader will be able to, with the force of vision, professionalism, passion, commitment, and intellection, distill the compelling proposition in the African political economy that will shape new ideology with regards to the role of market relative to the role of the state. This will be an African alternative to Washington consensus inspired neoliberalism. Two, there is a need to remodel the business of governments within the framework of a cultural adjustment program. While the creation of a developmental state and rebuilding its core to the African recovery and transformation agenda, there is an imperative need for the reassessment of the role of the state vis-a-vis -vis the economy, the business sector, and non-state actors as a basis for remodeling how government go about doing its business. A critical complement to institutional renewal is the need for widespread reorientation of values by which any state can re-engineer its fundamental institution. Etunga Manguel caused this cultural adjustment program, which involved inducing, infusing institutions with those African humanistic values of solidarity, social interaction, love of neighbor, care for environment, and so on. The, 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 that's the, the best example is the Ubuntu. The cultural adjustment program according to Otwanga Manguela must begin urgently in four significant sectors education, economics, politics, and social life. The objective of cultural adjustment program through value orientation should be such that it leads to the gradual but steady evolution of a new mental model that shifts focus from short term to long term policy orientation, from certificated illiteracy in our education delivery to reflective practice and skills orientation, from profligacy and rapid consumerism to an investment mentality. This institutional and cultural renewal would however not happen without the creation of a new generation of elites that are purposeful to craft a new African ideology. Three, institutional reform in Paris. Permit me this last section to outline the reform philosophy that stands at the core of my continued advocacy for administrative and institutional reform in Nigeria. I'm convinced beyond doubt that Africa's third liberation hinges on getting the fundamentals of administrative reform right as the first condition for getting the imperative of democratic governance right. There is a compelling need for deep-seated institutional reform that is rooted in the redefinition of the role of the state, value the construction of what Peter Eke calls the migrated structure, especially public service institutions, facilitating public service move from old Weberia, Mas Weber's model, to a new public service conceptualized in new neoliberalism. The creation of a new breed of public manager in African state who, who will supervise the important task of just starting the new productivity paradigm that will serve as the fundamental foundation upon which democracy and the development can be facilitated. Respected convener, distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to summarize what I've said by restating the point that deepening poverty which the celebrated growth of the African rising of the yesterday years did not elevate reduces the chances of election that are issue-based, which in turn limits the potential for the emergence of transformational leaders in African countries. <coughs> Thus, creating a new generation, in spite of that, creating a new generation of de-tribalized and cosmopolitan leaders distinguished by their managerial Substantial and policy intelligence still remain irreducible. And they are to be reviewed institutions to create capable developmental states, distill compelling values for position in the African political economy that could shape new ideology. This will not go far unless government remodeled the business of government through institutional renewal and deep seated uh, uh, cultural adjustment program. In conclusion, Africa stands at a critical junction 
which could either submerge the continent in the predicament of the past or transform her into a vibrant force in global competitiveness and development. Africa's current liberation depends on our capacity to put in place a comprehensive program of institutionalization and institutional rebuilding that will give life to our development drive. The hope of achieving the emergence of developmental states in Africa hinges on the, this institutional imperative. This understanding of the developmental state sustains each family within an institutional context that captures the dynamics of free, a framework of good and democratic government. It is my family hope that this of God's conference will do justice to these critical issues that tie the democracy, development, and African policy, good, good government institutionalism, Afro futurism together in a way that speaks strongly to the entangled destiny of proactive leadership and institutional law in Africa. I also sincerely hope that this of God's guardian of African scholar and Africanist intellectual across the globe will be able to take this inside and thought further into a serious interrogation of the dynamics, structures, frameworks, paradigms, and methodologies involved in the dynamic relationship between leadership and institution in Africa. I thank you very much.